Welcome back to the reading of The Mysterious Benedict Society by Trenton Lee Stewart. Today we will be reading the chapter called Lessons Learned. The Learning Institute for the Very Enlightened was unlike other schools. For one thing, the cafeteria food smelled good and tasted even better. Beyond that, there were no textbooks, no field trips, no report cards, no roll call, if you were missing, an executive came to find you. No rickety film projectors, no lockers, no team sports, no library, and weirdly enough, no mirrors to be found anywhere. Nor was there any separation between beginning and advanced students. Class groups were assigned at random, regardless of age or accomplishment, and everyone in that group sat in the same classrooms together learning the same lessons. The lessons had been designed by Mr. Curtin himself, and when all of them had been gotten through, they were repeated from the beginning. Thus, all the lessons were eventually reviewed many times, and the students who learned them best became messengers. None of this was familiar to the members of the mysterious Benedict Society, and yet in certain ways, the Institute rem did remind them of other schools rote memorization of lessons was discouraged but required. Class participation was encouraged but rarely permitted. And although quizzes were given every day in every class, there was always at least one student who groaned, another who acted surprised, and another who begged the teacher in vain not to give it. Time's up, SQ Pedalian called out during the morning class one day. Pass me your quizzes everyone and no dawdling please a stitch in time saves time you know nine corrected a messenger in the middle row rainy recognized her from his other classes a tall athletic teenager with piercing eyes and raven black hair she was much older and bolder than most of the students and had a reputation as the leader among messengers her name was martina crow Nine stitches? SQ said, no, Martina, I'm certain it's just one stitch. No, a stitch in time saves nine, Martina scoffed. Exactly, SQ replied. With all the quizzes all collected, the room fell silent as SQ went through the pages, marking grades in his book. It was the hourly ritual. In every class, an executive first presented the day's material, then the material was reviewed, and sometimes the review was reviewed, and then the students were given a quiz over the previous day's lesson. If the material weren't so strange, no doubt, it would have been easily mastered. Today, the Mysterious Benedict Society's third full day of classes, SQ's lesson had been called Personal Hygiene, Unavailable Dangers, or unavoidable dangers and what must be done to avoid them. Like all the lessons at the Institute, this one was a barrage of details, pages and pages worth, but the gist was that sickness, like a hungry predator, lurked in every nook and cranny. Every touchable surface was a disease waiting to happen. Every speck of dust and allergen poised to swell your nose and clog your ducts. Every toothbrush bristle, bacterial playground. On and on it went, and all of it was greatly exaggerated, Rainey thought, though not entirely untrue. What made the lesson so confusing was the logical conclusion. SQ said must be drawn because it was impossible in the end to protect yourself from anything. No matter how hard you tried, it was important to try as hard as you could to protect yourself from everything. There was some kind of truth hidden in there, Rainey thought, but it was camouflaged with nonsense. No wonder it gave students trouble. Luckily, he and Sticky had been making perfect scores. To confirm this, Rainey glanced over at his friend, who gave a nod and a thumbs up. Probably wasn't even difficult for him. Sticky remembered everything he laid eyes on. So far, so good. Rainey twisted in his seat to look at Kate. She puffed her cheeks, crossed her eyes, and put her hands on her head as if she thought it might pop. Not good. Rainey decided not to look at Constance. His optimism had been spoiled enough. The other students sat mostly in stupors, worn out from the class, or else were scouring their notes in hopes of discovering they'd done better than they thought. 
The messengers, though, there were four in the class, wearing their snappy white tunics and blue sashes, were indulging in a peculiar habit Rainy had noticed. Every few moments, one of them would glance at the door, eyes focused with keen expectation. Martina Crow was especially fixed. They were waiting to be called out by an executive, called away for their secret privileges. And whenever the executive did appear in the doorway, as Jackson did now, every messenger in the room stiffened with anticipation. SQ, Jackson announced, I need Corliss Danton and Sylvie Biggs. The messengers in question leapt from their desks, hastily gathering their things with beaming faces and nary a backward glance. They followed Jackson out. Martina Crow stared hungrily after them. For the newcomers among us, SQ said, let me remind you that you too could be privy to the special privileges enjoyed by our messengers. Study hard, especially you brand new recruits, who are doing very well, by the way. Rosie Gardner, Eustace Crust, very well done. You each got several answers correct. Keep up the good work. He smiled encouragingly toward the back of the room and returned to his grading. Rainey turned in his seat to see whom SQ was speaking to, and then he could hardly stop staring. New recruits, SQ had called them, and indeed, these were the two whose dazed expressions had caught Rainey's attention the first day. The bell-shaped girl and the wiry boy he'd suspected of being kidnapped. They scarcely seemed the same children now. Their looks of sleepy confusion had disappeared, replaced by a look of purpose, even of pleasure in their eyes. These were not the expressions of children who had been kidnapped and secreted away against their will. But then, why had they been escorted by recruiters? And why else would they call, be called recruits? Rainey suspected himself of leaping to conclusions. He used to think he was good at understanding people. Miss Perumal had told him so more than once, but these kids were a mystery to him. Somehow he was getting it all wrong. He had to be. And speaking of getting it wrong, Rainey's eyes now fell on Constance, sound asleep with her face on her desk. Rainey felt suddenly depressed. He needed to stop turning around. SQ finished grading the quizzes and stacked the papers on the edge of his desk. Okay, everyone, class dismissed. You may check your quizzes as you leave. And someone had better wake Miss Contraire. I'm fairly sure, certain she's alive. I saw her twitch. Raynard Muldoon and George Washington, please stay after class. I need to speak with you. Rainey's throat tightened and he glanced at Sticky, who looked as if he'd been stung by a hornet. Were they suspected of something? As the others filed out of the classroom, Kate gave the boys a meaningful look. Good luck, her eyes said. Constance stumbled blearily past without looking at them, and then the two boys started up to SQ's desk. Their path was suddenly cut off by Martina Crow, who fixed them with a stare of barely contained fury. Startled, the boy stepped back as if they'd come upon a rattlesnake. That's right, Martina hissed. Step back. She glared at them, radiating menace. Rainey wondered what to do. Should he ask her what was wrong? Would this encourage her to attack? Martina, SQ said from his desk, do you need something? I know why you want to speak with them, Martina said, not taking her eyes from the boys' alarmed faces. Good for you. Now I do need to speak with them, so please excuse us. I'll go, Martina said, but not far. She leaned toward the boys and whispered, Do you hear me? Not far. Certainly not far enough, Rainy thought as she stalked from the room. Why was she so angry? Did she suspect them of something too? Trembling now, the boys approached the desk. SQ looked grave. I'm afraid you two are in hot water. But why? Asked Rainy. Sticky wobbled as if he might fall down. You have Martina on edge. That's why. Frankly, fellows, I'm simply astonished. Or rather, I should say, astounded. No, that's not quite right. Astonished? Rainy prompted. Astounded? SQ nodded. 
Those, too. Furthermore, I'm amazed. How are you boys doing so well on your quizzes? You're making perfect scores. I think Martina overheard me talking about it with another executive, by the way, which is why she dislikes you now. Sticky regained his balance. Rainy's breathing slowed. They weren't in trouble, after all, except for some reason with Martina Crow. SQ gave them appraising, an appraising look. How do you explain your grades? It's unlikely anyone is helping you. You're brand new, and other students naturally shun new kids, so they wouldn't be helping you. I remember things, said Sticky simply. I try hard, said Rainy. SQ looked as if this was just what he'd suspected. Rememberingness and effortfulness, both fine qualities. It seems you two have an abundant supply. I just wanted to congratulate you and tell you to keep it up. Like Eustace and Rosie? Rainy asked. Oh, those two? They're a different case, boys. They're special recruits. Special recruits get extra attention in the early days by order of Mr. Curtin. They're a little slow to come around and they need encouragement. But you watch, one day they'll be top students. Special recruits often end up as messengers and many become executives. Take Jackson and Jilson, for example. They were special recruits themselves. What makes special recruits so special? Sticky asked. He almost sounded jealous. SQ seemed troubled by this question. Well, as for that, I can't really say. Uh, here nor there. All I need to know is, well, you don't need to know anything, except for the material, that is. Obviously, you must know that. And how to... Actually, I suppose there are many things you should know, but... He checked himself, cleared his throat, and said, <clears throat> Just work hard, boys, and you'll have nothing to worry about. Except Martina, said Rainy. She looked like she wanted to throttle us. SQ laughed. She probably does. You're showing her up. Perfect quiz scores <clears throat> are extremely rare. If you boys continue like this, you'll be messengers in no time. And so naturally, the messengers hate you. There's a limited number of messengers, you see, and no guarantee that you will stay a messenger. Have a bad week on your quizzes and another student might take your spot. Does that happen often? Rainy asked. Hardly ever, SQ said. Messengers can't bear to lose their special privileges. I remember how awful I felt whenever I had to turn in my sash and tunic. Happened to me several times, but eventually I got all the lessons down like butter, like a pat of butter. Got them down pat and never lost my position again, until I w was made executive, that is. Anyway, I suppose to Martina you seem like a threat. I understand her feeling, though of course there's no call for her to be so cranky about it. Cranky was hardly the word, Rainy thought. Venomous was more like it. They would have to watch out for Martina Crow. The next chapter is called People and Places to be Avoided. Rainy and Sticky spent the rest of the morning looking nervously over their shoulders. Between classes, they hurried through the corridors not wanting to be ambushed by Martina, and when at lunchtime they spotted Martina lingering near the cafeteria counter, they put off getting their lunches despite the insistent growling in their bellies. Instead, they found a table and waited for Kate and Constance. When the girls returned from the counter, Rainy and Sticky quickly related what SQ had told them about messengers, and also what had happened with Martina. The cafeteria was so absurdly loud they could speak in normal voices and not be overheard, but it was all Kate could do to keep her voice below an outraged shout. Where's Martina now? She said, glancing left and right. I'm trying not to see her, Sticky said. Easy, Kate, Rainy said. He nodded discreetly toward a distant table. She sat, just sat down at one of the messenger tables. Every now and then she shoots darts with her eyes. But let's not worry about it. We'll need to avoid her, that's all. Constance wiped her mouth with her sleeve. Hey, when you boys get your lunch trays, bring me back some ice cream. Whatever happened to asking, Sticky said. Whatever happened to please? Rainy looked at Constance, who, by the way of answering Sticky, was poking her tongue out. She did have terrible manners, it was true. She spilled food with abandon, chewed with her mouth often 
open as often as not and held her utensils like shovels. But Rainey found her behavior more sad than irritating. He knew she must never have had anyone to teach her better manners. He had no idea what her life had been like before. Constance hated being asked questions and generally ignored them, or else responded by making rude sounds. But it was obvious she'd had little guidance. Constance noticed Rainey looking at her. She bugged her eyes and opened her mouth to show him her chewed up food. She didn't like being looked at any more than she liked being asked questions. Rainy and Sticky went up to the counter to order their lunches. The helpers were stirring soups and tossing pizza dough and otherwise attending to a huge array of dishes, all of which smelled heavenly and the boys' mouths were watering like sprinkler systems. Rainy finally settled on lasagna and chocolate milk and ice cream since Sticky refused to do Constance's bidding. Rainy just didn't feel like dealing with a whining session. The helper, who took his order, nodded silently, averting her eyes and set about preparing the tray. Rainey watched her uneasily. Only a few helpers had ever spoken to him and not one had made eye contact. Apparently, Mr. Curtin had laid down strict rules about this. It was a strange requirement of the workers' jobs, this constant show of deference, but the helpers met it admirably. In fact, they were so silent and shy of eye contact that Rainey tried not to greet them or even look at them much. To him, this felt profoundly rude, but doing otherwise always seemed to make the helpers uncomfortable. Sticky must have been thinking about the same thing because when they had rejoined the girls at the table, he said, can you imagine a worse job than being a helper? Aren't they sad a lot? Said Kate. No talking, no eye contact, no way I could work a job like that. I'd have to be sedated. Hey. Maybe they are being sedated, Sticky suggested. Maybe there's something in their food. Kate shook her head. I've seen them eating the same food they serve us, and we're just fine, aren't we? They all looked uncomfortably at Constance, who had finished gulping her ice cream and let her sticky chin drop to her chest. Her eyelids were fluttering and her breathing had deepened into a snore. Well, but she was that way before we got here, said Rainy. It was a long and wearisome day. The afternoon classes went much the same as the morning ones. First, Rainey would feel heartened by how well he and Sticky had done on the quiz, then dismayed by the hateful looks their successes brought them. From other students and messengers in general, but especially from Martina. And if Kate and Constance were drawing no such unpleasant attention themselves, it was only because they were having a terrible time with the quizzes, which was even more discouraging. When the last class was dismissed, the four of them went out onto the plaza and sat on a stone bench. All but Kate, who bounced in place, burning off energy. Most of the Institute students spent the hour before supper playing in the gym, or else watching television in their rooms, but the mysterious Benedict Society had wanted a little time to themselves. As it turned out, they spent their whole time on the plaza, undisturbed by Martina or anyone at all. And yet, they spoke hardly a word. The reason was that they could not stop staring, with a curious mixture of fascination, fear, and uneasiness at Mr. Curtin in his green plaid suit, silvery glasses, and demonic wheelchair. The plaza was a favorite spot of his. The children had seen him there the day before, too, and also at night. It was well known that Mr. Curtin often sat there for an hour or so in the afternoons, during which time no one ever disturbed him but executives and they came to him only with urgent matters. This afternoon was no different. Everyone who crossed the plaza gave Mr. Curtin a wide berth, and no one ever passed in front of him, as he seemed to delight in gazing off toward the bridge in the distance, and no one wished to disrupt his view. Gazing aside, Mr. Curtin was hardly idle. He had a stack of newspapers with him and was going through them meticulously, occasionally marking things and smiling mysteriously. From time to time, he opened a large book, which he carried in his lap, and made a note inside it. Then he would gaze off into the distance again. Eventually, Mr. Curtin spun around and shot across the plaza, disappearing inside the Institute Control Building and snapping the children out of their trance. 
Having spent so much time staring, and since at supper they were unable to get a table to themselves, the children would have to wait until after lights out for any secret discussions, for the evenings were devoted to study time. It was essential that Rainy and Sticky continue to do well on their quizzes, especially if Kate and Constance didn't start doing well. And at any rate, one of the few rules of the, the executive seemed willing to admit to was that students were not allowed in another's rooms. Private meetings among regular students were the sort of thing strictly frowned upon at the Institute, where all secrets were reserved for messengers and executives. There was no prohibition regarding the dormitory corridors during study time, however, and before the children holed up in their rooms to labor over their notes, they lingered a few minutes outside the door to Rainy and Sticky's room. If they didn't talk to each other now, it was only because they were eavesdropping. They had discovered that at this time of day, there was a considerable amount of activity and conversation in the corridor, which always provided an opportunity to learn something. Here and there along the corridor, little clusters of students stood talking, reluctant to knuckle down and study yet. And a steady stream of children toting toothbrushes and toiletries passed in and out of the bathrooms. This evening, the most obvious eavesdroppers were Rainy and Sticky's neighbors, a couple of thick-headed, thick-middled older boys who had made a point of never speaking to Rainy and Sticky. The boys stood in their doorway playing a game that involved kicking each other in the shins without crying out, and as they kicked and grimaced back and forth, they speculated endlessly about the messenger's secret privileges. This was a favorite conversation among non-messengers, but never a productive one, and it was no different with these boys. It soon became clear neither had any idea what the privileges were, only that they were much to be coveted. The boys' talk quickly wore thin, and Rainy was just about to give up and go study when Jackson's voice boomed down the corridor. Corliss Danton, there you are. A few doors down, Corliss Danton jumped. Everyone jumped, but Corliss jumped highest. He turned to look with strangely guilty eyes at Jackson, who came marching toward him through the little cluster of students, all of whom flattened themselves against the walls to let him pass. The corridor, just moments ago, all gossip and hubbub, fell silent as a graveyard. Corliss straightened his messenger sash as Jackson came up. What, what's the matter, Jackson? You know what the matter is, Corliss, said Jackson. Mr. Curtin needs to speak with you. I've come to show you to the waiting room. At the mention of the waiting room, Corliss, who was fair-skinned to bink in with, turned positively white. The boys from the neighboring room flinched and took a quick step backward, trying to disassociate themselves. A murmur spread down the corridor. But, but, Corliss cleared his throat. He tugged at the bottom of his tunic. But come on, Jackson, why would I be punished? But what, you aren't being punished. Mr. Curtin only wants to speak with you. But he's busy at the moment, so you'll have to wait. Come with me right now. Corliss shook his head and stepped back. I, you know what? I, I don't think so. I think I'll just, just, he glanced left and right, contemplating the corridor exits. Jackson's tone was casual but firm. I understand you don't like to wait, Corliss. Nobody likes waiting. But if you don't go, want to go to the waiting room and lose your special privileges, then you'd better come along right now. Corliss cringed. No, 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 that won't, won't be necessary. I'll go with you, Jackson. I suppose one way or another, I'm going to have to wait. Is that right? One way or another. Corliss took a deep breath and studied himself. Okay, you bet. Whatever Mr. Curtin wants, you'll get no complaints from me. Jackson winked. That a boy. Let's get moving. He put his hand on Corliss's shoulder and walked him out to the far exit. The moment Corliss was gone, the corridor erupted into a cacophony of excited conversation. One girl even burst into tears. She'd been once been to the waiting room herself, apparently, and was distraught at the mere mention of the place. As the girl's friends tried to console her, Rainy and Sticky's thick-headed neighbors were still staring at the exit through which Jackson had led Corliss as if to his doom. The waiting room. One boy said, I didn't know messengers ever got sent to the waiting room. Let's not talk about it, said the other, shaking his head. I think it's bad luck to talk about it. I don't need that kind of luck. 
the boys went into the room and closed the door behind them. Rainy and the others looked anxiously at one another. I think perhaps we ought to avoid being sent to the waiting room, said Constance. You think, said Kate. Sticky took out his polishing cloth. And that's the end of the chapter. When we meet again, I will read Logical Conclusions and Miscalculations. Have a good day.